is also uh, part of the university days, uh, this special week in which we have uh, all these uh, wonderful events. Uh, so we are uh, broadcasting it on two channels. Uh, one is the Zoom meeting where uh, some of uh, our audience have, has logged in and another one is live on Facebook. Uh, that will have a delay of a few seconds. Okay, we have a very interesting topic, um, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. Uh, we have uh, implemented two major projects already within our university with the help of Professor Simeonescu. I wanted uh, uh, to share this, uh, this uh, field of research, the experiences in this field of research with you. So please, Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first, before I start, I want to congratulate Dr. Olah for his initiative. He was telling me about it um, a couple of months ago, and I thought it's a wonderful opportunity for all junior and future scientists to be exposed to modern science and uh, different people having different views on different uh, aspects. So again, congratulations, and thank you for the invitation to present today. Thank I'm you. We start. hope oh. it's the start of something that will grow. Yeah, yeah, and I will always be happy to help, uh, help, it, help, help it grow. That's the term. I'm going to share my screen now so I can get started. Can you see my slide and can you hear me? Yeah, very good. All right, so um, the title that we agreed upon uh, was Research Opportunities in Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine. And what you will see today is the result of a, a, of a wonderful collaboration with Ume Fetel Gumuresh and especially with Dr. Marius Harpa who is now the director of the Regenerative Medicine Laboratory at uh, Umefeter Gumuresh. So if you start uh, fresh and never really heard anything about tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, what you will see immediately, uh, you will see this type of paradigms. So the paradigm of regenerative medicine is that we should be able having all the knowledge that we have at hand now, we should be able to use, let me get a pointer, use um, cells from a patient to isolate and culture in the lab, which we now do very uh, easily and uh, proliferate them. And then we should be able to use these cells so that um, we could regenerate some of the disease tissues in that patient using scaffolds and maybe a step of uh, tissue development in the lab. So this is a general overview of the tissue engineering paradigm. If you go into more specific details, you're going to see that um, you can use stem cells from the epidermis, adipose derived stem cells, all kinds of other stem cells. The second row is always going to be common. This will be the scaffold you can have um, polymeric scaffold, all kinds of other types of scaffolds. Then you combine them, their combination sometimes leads to, um, to not real tissues, but I would, I would call them pre-tissues. And these require different stimulation, development in the lab, sometimes maybe mechanoelectrical growth factors and so on. Finally, being able to regenerate skin, uh, fatty tissue, heart tissue, cartilage, bone, and the list goes on and on. I think to date, uh, almost all tissues have been uh, studied using this um, regenerative medicine paradigm. So that being said, uh, I'm gonna focus today on just one simple, apparently simple, interesting tissue, and that is the aortic valve. The aortic valve, uh, of course, known to everyone uh, in the audience today, is considered the most frequently diseased, the most frequently replaced, 
and the most researched valve in the body. And you recognize it here in the diagram and in the uh, animation, in the movie. What is important is that uh, the aortic valve tissue is the most mechanically stressed tissue in the body. As you can imagine, it functions continuously. You see the motions there very clearly. And it also it undergoes a huge difference in pressure in less than one second. And uh, during that motion and extension and closure, you have about 10 to 20% stretch of the cusp of the actual leaflet in both circumferential and radial uh, direction. So overall, we're looking at a tissue that is supposed to withstand about 3.2 billion times in a lifetime. So right now, uh, you can look at any type of uh, man-made material. We do not have the ability to, ability to synthesize a man-made material that can withstand 3.2 billion times of um, moving and bending and stretching the way that this tissue undergoes. So one question that we, you would ask uh, yourself immediately is, what is the secret? Well, there is really no big secret, but there is a specific um, uh, structure and a specific type of cell that combine to ensure the durability of this tissue. So the aortic root is considered a functional unit. You, you do have the aorta, you have the cusps, and if you open up the aortic root and lay it down, you're gonna see the aorta here on top. There's the sinus, the three cusps, the little pockets, and a small portion of the ventricular muscle. So first of all, you realize this is a functional unit. They do function together uh, in the body. And as it opens and closes, this is just a, a uh, testing in the lab, you can recognize that the cusp tissue, which is the focus of our investigation, undergoes a lot of different types of uh, biomechanical motions and hemodynamic changes. You can see shear stress, bending here on the left, lower left. You can see tensile stretch during closure. So there's actual pressure on the cusps. And in, in diastole, you can see a lot of pressure on the tissue. So how do we design such a tissue capable of withstanding these type of um, biomechanical challenges? The tissue biology is pretty well known. It's really not a complicated tissue. This is just a uh, uh, macro image of a right coronary cusp. This is the cusp taken out, cut out, dissected out. If you do um, uh, histology analysis and you look at what is inside, inside you will find collagen, elastin, gags, stain here with the pentachrome uh, stain, and uh, cells. The cells are red in this uh, stain, and you can see fibroblast inside or valvular and testicial cells, sometimes called VICs, and endothelial cells on the surface on both the surfaces. What is important is that these cells are capable of maintaining matrix homeostasis. What does it mean? It means that it can, they can repair uh, small damages within this tissue every time this happens. So when a small amount of collagen is damaged because of mechanics, these cells will make new collagen. So this is probably the secret to longevity of these heart valves. Um, what we have in the valves is typically a quiescent valvular interstitial cell. So the cell sits there, doesn't really do much, maybe helps with matrix regeneration when needed. However, in pathology, after activation, you can get calcified valvular interstitial cells, which leads to valve pathology. And everybody knows uh, aortic valve pathology. I'm not going to insist here. What is important is that these cells now are not fibroblasts anymore. They're actually osteoblasts. So they're bone-like cells that induce stenosis. And we know the clinical aspects of that, the, the clinical uh, information, and uh, I wouldn't insist on that. What is important is that right now, we do not have drug therapy for valve degeneration. The only treatment we have to date is surgical replacement with artificial devices. And of course, a very important category of patients is that of 
uh, pediatric patients where congenital defects, for example, bicuspid valve, um, could also be candidates for tissue engineered heart valves. So this is where we are uh, to date. We can use homographs. These are human valves, cryopreserved. They have good durability, but limited supply. We can use mechanical valves that are highly thrombogenic, so this comes with problems. And we can use tissue valves. These are glutaraldehyde fixed dead animal tissues that will degenerate and calcify in 15 to 20 years. And probably the most technically challenging, but the most successful is the autograph where you can take a pulmonary valve and move it to the aortic position. This is called the Ross operation. This is uh, not done routinely everywhere. It's technically quite difficult. And you also need something to put in uh, to replace the pulmonary valve, sometimes a homograph. What is important for pediatric patients is that none of these solutions can grow in size with the patient. So clearly we have a clinical need for a new type of living functional valves for young and adult patients. Uh, again, for pediatric patients, it would be great if these living valves could actually grow as the body grows in size. So we established some prerequisites, some conditions that we need to fill. And these are, we want to have a sturdy structure and proper hemodynamics. This is very important. We realize the cells are important in maintaining the matrix, extracellular matrix self repair. We want to reduce risks for bleeding, thrombosis, and degeneration. And we consider a valve that fulfills these four criteria, the ideal valve. So our approach is that of a stem cell-based tissue engineering approach. So take home message number one. Uh, until now, we have shown that valves are very intricate structures, very special hemodynamics. They contain special cells and uh, exhibit a very specialized matrix biology. We do not fully understand pathogenesis of aortic valves so that we could prevent it or treat it um, pharmaceutically. And the artificial replacements do have limitations that we know uh, pretty well. And therefore, we consider there is still a clinical need for uh, living tissue engineered valves. And all these aspects have to be considered when you design a regenerative approach so that these criteria that I mentioned before are fulfilled. Now, adult stem cells have uh, started uh, at least about 20 years ago and generated a lot of enthusiasm. They have potential for therapy and regeneration. Everywhere you look, you see the ability of a stem cell to regenerate pretty much any and uh, all tissues in our body. You can use stem cell therapy by extracting these cells and injecting them directly into different tissues, or even in the heart, or you can use the cells together with scaffolds to generate these tissues. So we, when we started this about 20 years ago, we got excited as well, and we decided to work with stem cells for heart valve tissue regeneration. Now, adult stem cells uh, that you can obtain from a patient for example, uh, adipose tissue stem cells can be used in the lab and in therapy because of they, they are capable of paracrine activity. This means that they secrete cytokines, growth factors. So they're very useful in angiogenesis, immune modulation, inflammation. We are not going this way. We are going into the direction of uh, helping them convincing them to differentiate into target cells for regeneration purposes. So the working hypothesis is that we can use acellular valves as stem cell niches. So acellular valves can be obtained by decellularization. This is not- Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh-oh, Siri woke up. Um, this is not a um, English word really, but it, it kind of entered the English language in the last 10 years or so. So we take a target tissue, for example, a fresh porcine aortic root. We extract all the cells, which contains most of the antigens. We generate a target tissue niche that will allow us to uh, 
reseed or reintroduce patient cells into that particular niche so that after adaptation conditioning uh, in the lab, you have the regenerated target tissue. So this is the working hypothesis that guided these studies that I'm gonna to show today. Now, one very important question that I get every time I present this is, how safe is it to use a porcine decellularized tissue? Well, uh, up to date, more, I think this number has to be bigger now, more than uh, 1.5 million patients have been implanted with decellularized tissues obtained from human, bovine, porcine, equine sources. All of these have been FDA approved. You see the different um, uh, commercial uh, products here. Some of you, I think, even use them in surgery, in the clinic as, um, as, a job, uh, as materials or biomaterials for different reconstructions. If you look at the materials, you recognize skin, um, porcine, small intestinal submucosa, pericardium, fascia lata, and so on. But what you don't see here are valves. So our uh, purpose is to develop these acellular valves into a, a clinically applicable, uh, hopefully FDA approved biomaterial. So what is a recipe for a tissue engineered aortic heart valve? Well, first of all, you take uh, one valve matrix, let's say a scaffold, you add in slowly 10 million stem cells from the patient, you bake this into the bioreactor and um, insert them into the matrix and voila, the valve is ready to go. So uh, we definitely hope it was that simple, but you'll see how it works. So in order to test our hypothesis, we put together a proposed translational scenario. So you start with the patient, a cute little sheep here, you collect fat, adipose tissue, you isolate stem cells, you seed these cells into decellularized valves, condition them, prepare them for implantation and implant them back into the same patient as autologous implants. And we're gonna go step by step uh, to show you some results that we obtain along the way. Uh, working on cells, now we are capable of differentiating adipose derived stem cells, so stem cells from the fat into endothelial cells and fibroblasts. Here's the data where we incubated endothelial cells with different growth factors and exposed them to shear. And you can see that after differentiation, they start expressing different markers, which are very specific to endothelial cells, uptake of LDL, CD31, von Willebrand factors, Enos and so on. So this, uh, this is a, a way of validation of this differentiation using endothelial cells as positive controls. Uh, overall, uh, we see that uh, these differentiated cells are very close to endothelial cells. We don't know if they are true endothelial cells, but they do express all these markers. So we decided to use them in our seeding experiments. We can also differentiate uh, adipose-derived stem cells separately in, in different experiments towards fibroblasts. You incubate them with a transforming growth factor for three weeks, and they start expressing the uh, specific markers that are also common to fibroblasts, vimentin, prolyl 4 hydroxylase, type 1 collagen, and so on. So the take-home message number two for this part is that adipose-derived stem cells can be easily isolated from fat samples and can be pre-differentiated towards valve cell phenotypes. And we believe we can use adipose-derived stem cells as cell sourcing for valve regeneration. So in step two, how do we prepare decellularized valves? We realized from the get-go that uh, we're dealing with different types of tissues. So at first, we just uh, tried to decellularize the whole aortic root by immersion in, in solutions of detergent and enzymes, and it just didn't work uh, too well. And then we decided to set up a system where we mount the valves shown here on the A, B, C, D, up, up to J, mounted in special mounting uh, systems, and then in a perfusion device that pushes the detergents, the nucleases, all the reagents through the thick aortic wall, as you see here in the video, 
And this allowed us to fully, to fully decelerize porcine aortic roots up to 90 something percent. How do we validate that? We do histology and uh, we look at uh, the presence of cells. So you can see here cells are uh, stained blue with DAPI. And after decelerization, this would be the red. Um, you do not see cells anymore, no more nuclei. This is how the tissue looks before, a little bit pinkish, reddish. After decelerization, it's practically snow white. So there's no more cells there, only collagen. We looked at uh, histological aspects of these valves, again, comparing with native. Uh, after decelerization, we still have um, maintain the collagen, the elastin. We did lose some gags, which are known to be water soluble. So that is one of the drawbacks of the method. We uh, isolated DNA from those tissues. So you have fresh uh, valve DNA isolated here. You can see it in the agarose gel electrophoresis. After decelerization, there is zero DNA, absolutely no traces of DNA, indicating that these uh, valves are completely acellular. We check biomechanical properties before and after to make sure that these uh, treatments that we perform on the tissues, the perfusion decelerization, does not change properties. The only minor changes we saw were here, highlighted by the asterisk. Um, but again, the tissues performed really well. Bending was uh, maintained in both directions, and also elasticity was maintained in both directions. More importantly, uh, hemodynamics had to be checked and we used the bioreactor in the lab, which I'll describe in a second, to understand how the valves open and close. And this is slow motion videos of the fresh aortic root compared to the acellular aortic root. And you can see that there's really no major difference. We measure the geometric orifice area of these two types of valves, starting with the uh, opening and closing. Pretty much, we realized that decelerization very well preserved aortic root hemodynamics. So the final product is this uh, snow white um, acellular root. Looks good, looks great, functions well. It's fully acellular. It's also porous. This, this is where the cells used to be. So we have pores that we can use for reseeding. Uh, the matrix was preserved and mechanical properties were maintained. So now we have the cells, we have the uh, matrices, we have the acellular valves, we go into seeding. The work plan for seeding is to in introduce fibroblasts that we obtain from uh, the differentiation studies interstitially inside the cusps and uh, endothelial cells that we obtain from differentiation to put inside the lumen to cover the surfaces of the valves and also the ventricular aspect of it as well. So if you combine all of this, you're gonna have a lot of cells inside this acellular scaffold in the right position, or different cells in the right position. So some results with the interstitial recellularization, which is done by hand using a syringe, uh, followed by rotator and bioreactor conditioning. You see some results here. Uh, some areas are very nicely populated by cells, staying here in uh, brown or by menthine which is a, a, a marker of the fibroblast that we had injected for interstitial. Uh, now we use fibrin gels as carriers because we realize this helps maintain the viability of the cells a little bit better. And this, these are examples of uh, fibrin gel embedded uh, cell seeded scaffolds. After uh, placed in the bioreactor, we still maintain pretty good number of uh, cells after a couple of weeks of bioreactor conditioning. So this went pretty well. The luminal recellularization with endothelial cells compared to a fresh tissue shown up here. After three days, after 13 days in the bioreactor, the cells start to align. These are all live cells, stained uh, green fluorescent, start to align. And by scanning electron microscopy, you can see a lot of cells cover surfaces still some surfaces are not fully covered. So this has to be improved probably by um, additional seeding of the endothelial cells. 
All these, uh, after seeding, they go into the bioreactor. This is a system that has been developed for the last 12 years or so in the lab, and now it's commercialized by Aptus. And the, the system fits nicely into in a self-culture incubator. The valve goes here into a special um, holder, and cell culture media is being pumped using a, a pneumatic pump controlled by a computer. Uh, air is provided through the filter. Uh, everything is sterile. And if you, you have a little window here on top and you can see the valve moving nicely like that. So you can uh, watch the valve. We put webcams on top of it and we can watch it from home just to make sure that the valve works properly all the time. The system ensures heart rate, pressures, uh, differential, and flow rate, uh, which are all physiological for the type of valve that we are investigating. So take home message number three is that we can generate a completely decellularized aortic root. This is feasible. We have done it with probably hundreds of valves already. The uh, matrix, the extracellular matrix is integrity was maintained. The biomechanics and hemodynamics were preserved. And we believe that recellularization is feasible, but still challenging and requiring more work in that direction. So the next step will be to test this translational scenario in large animals. For this, uh, we got lucky enough to um, work with uh, University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Tegu Muresh, where uh, in the last um, eight years, more than eight years actually, uh, we have had a large number of sheep implanted with these valves regenerated with adipose stem cells. So in the first series of experiments, we used these cell valves with uh, autologous stem cells and we implanted them in the right ventricular outflow tract of the sheep. And here are some images of uh, how we did that. So fat was collected. Um, we if, didn't even know where to collect the fat from. So the, uh, a study was initiated in the first uh, few months to understand what is the best area to collect fat. Now we know what that is. Then um, fat was processed to test to isolate stem cells. Stem cells were tested for plasticity, meaning that we wanted to make sure that these stem cells are capable of differentiation. And we use the uh, classical kit for adipogenesis and staining with oil red O, chondrogenesis, staining with alizarin, uh, not alizarin, ocean blue, and osteogenesis uh, showing formation of bone particles. And so we know that these are uh, true stem cells. We seeded those uh, stem cells into the decellularized valves and implanted them into sheep. So here's a, a formation of a tube around the valve. The valve was seeded. And this is the right ventricular outflow tract ready to be implanted. This was implanted on a beating heart in an extra anatomic shunt between the right ventricle and pulmonary artery. Um, the procedure is uh, common to all right ventricular outflow tract reconstruction, and the uh, native pulmonary valve was ligated. Our first surviving patient was Mr. TB, shown here. Uh, here you can see Dr. Harpa, Suchu, and Kordos at Umefe Turgumuresh. I have to mention that during this process, during this project, Umefe has uh, invested a lot of time and effort in setting up uh, ICU uh, beds, so to speak, for the sheep in the uh, upper portion of the experimental station. And this was the first batch of uh, animals uh, that were named, as you can see. Even my name is here mentioned in two cases, which I was very happy. And preliminary results in sheep for the first series where we used autologous adipose-derived stem cells um, a cardiac echocardiography showed pretty good functioning after implantation. You see here the typical uh, clapping sign of the cusp uh, closing and opening. So far, we haven't seen calcifications, which is very important. No immune reactions, meaning that we have done a good job at decellularizing 
no cusp retraction like it was reported in other papers and we didn't see any thrombus. However, the cells that we had injected pretty much went missing. So we, have, we could not find any more cells and we believe that they, this is due to the fact that stem cells are very vulnerable to mechanical stresses. And we tested that. I, I'm not gonna spend the time showing you now, but we tested that in the lab and we showed that just after three to four days, um, seeded stem cells uh, went uh, missing in a bioreactor study. So we decided to pursue differentiation of the stem cells into fibroblast and endothelial cells so that these cells will be more robust after implantation. This is an example of a phase one results after 12 months, no cells, but very good integrity of the valve leaflet. You can see them here, very thin and functional. So this at least showed us that the, the structure of the valve is appropriate and uh, hemodynamics is maintained even after 12 months. So in the phase two of this project, which um, we are finishing this year, actually in, in February of next year, uh, we had, again, decellularized valves, differentiated stem cells into the fibroblast and endothelial cells, like I've shown you before, bioreactor, bioreactor conditioned these seeded uh, scaffolds, and finally, uh, implantation in sheet. So the, the um, translational scenario remained the same. The difference is that the stem cells have been differentiated and the valves have been conditioned in the bioreactor. Here are some aspects of the uh, valve preparation in the operating room. Um, cleaning, trimming to size, suturing inside, uh, in, using a beating heart, and uh, I have to mention that this is a, a national premiere. And um, you can see here very careful monitoring of the animals after operation with uh, excellent support from the animal facility, Dr. Bogdan Kordos and his team. And here is a cardiac um, echocardiography follow-up of all the animals. What we know thus far is that at six months, the tissue looks beautiful. It's nice and clean, no thickening, no calcification, no thrombosis. Um, we had a couple of uh, valves going for 12 months as well. So this is outstanding for 12 months in the sheep model. Uh, histologically, we started seeing cells showing up in the tissues. And this is probably the best result that we have thus far well, we see a lot of cells. We haven't stained them for markers yet, but they look like five valvular fibroblasts inside the structure of the cusp and many, many cells covering the surface, which we believe these are endothelial cells. So this is a very, type, very promising type of result, unpublished yet, getting ready to publish in a couple of months. So to summarize, we have shown that decellularization of aortic valve is successful, we can recellularize them with autologous cells differentiated from stem cells, it's quite challenging. And we can claim bench to large animal translation of regenerative medicine approaches as possible in, uh, in the University of Medicine and Pharmacy. What are the outcomes of this uh, eight year project? We develop novel technologies, now we have a whole platform technology, starting from desolarization to seeding to conditioning the bioreactor, which can be used for manufacturing, which will be the next step. We established standard operating procedures for all phases. This is important for approvals and for reproducibility. We have established quality control criteria according to ISO standards and EU standards. And uh, during this process, we had set up the regenerative medicine lab at Umefetur Gumures, which is uh, very well equipped. Now recently, it has just moved to the uh, Cheche MFA, and uh, it contains all the necessary equipment for pursuing this type of research. We had set up a large animal suite at Umefetur Gumures with all the necessary equipment for for performing pretty much any kind of surgery, including open heart surgery. 
we have a very uh, well-defined standardized animal care protocol for pre-operational, during surgery and post-operatory after doing almost 100 sheep implants in the last eight years or so. We have established research teams of biomaterials expertise, stem cell expertise, cardiovascular surgery, of course, pathology expertise and others. Uh, Dr. Movilano has started a student term club where she attracts uh, young uh, students into these uh, discussions about stem cells, scaffolds, and regenerative medicine approaches. Um, thus far, we have almost completed three PhD theses, um, Marius Harpa, uh, Hussam al Hussein, and I think Dr. Movilano soon. I counted 12 papers, of which six ISI in the last uh, eight years, 17 presentations, and three funded grants. We just got funded for another two years to pursue uh, this type of research uh, starting uh, this month. So overall, we are very happy to, to mention that using all these expertise, these experiments, and, and everyone contributing to this, we established a regenerative medicine nucleus, Tumefe Tergumores, which integrates all expertise possible, um, stem cell biology, bioreactors, bioengineering, biomechanics, veterinary surgery, and so on. So what are the opportunities? Just to kind of close the circle to the original title, we can develop further competitive regenerative medicine projects. We can provide free clinical validation of tissue engineered devices. This means taking it from small animals to actual large animal validation. We can initiate translation of regenerative medicine projects to the clinic because once you have the large animal data, you can submit to regulatory authorities all the data to ask for approval to actually generate clinical products. And uh, I encourage all of you to think about, initiate advanced projects at any level, even startup or if, uh, furthermore, to involve students, junior faculty, senior faculty, clinicians, basic scientists, engineers, and industry in developing um, solutions to degenerative uh, pathologies so that regenerative medicine can solve these problems. For more information, uh, you're welcome to contact our Dr. Marius Harpa, director of the Regenerative Medicine Lab at uh, Umefeter Gumures. I would like to acknowledge a very large group of people. The first row are some of uh, our collaborators at Clemson University, these, a large group of people uh, are the surgical team, the students, uh, I put et al, because I'm pretty sure I forgot somebody, at University of Medicine and Pharmacy, and Aptus Bioreactors, which helped us with the um, equipment, funding from the National Institutes of Health, and in Romania through two projects, uh, one that ended uh, a couple of years ago, one that ends next year, and there will be another one starting this month. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. I got a little emotional by the end. I mean, I have seen this story, not this presentation, I have seen this story a number of times at various conferences and events. But it's, I don't know, uh, I never get bored. <laughs> and <laughs> the novelty that you just shared, I wasn't up to date, that you actually found cells, not just in the tissue, but on the surface of the tissue. It was like, oh my God, we were waiting for that for so long. <laughs> I know. Yeah, waiting for eight years for that. Exactly. We have okay. some questions. Do you want me yeah. to address the questions in chat? Uh, I will read them and let's discuss them. Just one okay. second, so I can uh, also open the chat. Here it is. Okay, so uh, I am inviting the audience to write the questions in the chat. And uh, while we are discussing the first two questions that are here, and then we will take them uh, in the order that they appear. So one that I'm guessing uh, was written somewhere in the middle of the presentation, what is the best area for fat tissue collection? <laughs> 
uh, oh, yeah. specific. Yeah. Um, we had we had published that it's uh, interscapular uh, was found to be the best area, and the area also corresponds to the area that will be used later on for um, for the uh, surgical intervention. So it was very convenient. So short answer: interscapular in the back. Yep. Uh, another question what could be the reason for the regeneration of the valves also how is blood supply to these tissues established assuming this is even necessary so a little bit more details there so um, the reason for regeneration we don't know because these are a host tissue, host cells so we don't know if these are the original cells that we put in uh, six months before, or these are cells that came from the um, patient itself, from the sheep itself. However, we believe that this, at least it shows that the tissue is very friendly to cells. It might attract uh, the cells there. In order to prove that these are the original cells, we have to track the cells. We have to mark, label the cells before injection, and then wait for six months, take the valve out, and make sure that these are the exact same cells. So this is very difficult and very expensive type of research. We are happy that the right type of cells went to the right places in the valve, and there is no thickening and no calcification because any type of um, uh, sheep implantation uh, that initiates some kind of inflammation or host reaction, you will see thickening, fibrotic reactions, fibrosis, and calcification. And in these tissues, we did not find that. And that was very, very fortunate. As far as blood supply, um, as far as now, as far as I know, aortic valves are not vascularized at all. So we do not want to have blood supply into growing into these tissues. So this is one of the few tissues that does not have uh, blood vessels, luckily enough. Um, okay, so we don't want we do not want that to happen. Okay, and the follow-up questions: How are the cells marked? If we want to mark them. Oh, um, there are a few methods that you can do. That the easiest is to to mark to label them with a gene. And the easiest is to, to get a um, GFP. This is green fluorescent protein gene. You insert it into the genome, and it stays there for a, a long time, even if the cell divides. So it moves to the daughter cells after division. And um, you can see them by simply doing a fluorescent microscopy. So you take a section through the tissue, and you look for the green fluorescence. Uh, so it has been done before. Long-term labeling is not easy um, because of technical difficulties and so on. But um, I think right now we will be happy with the fact that the, the decellularized tissue becomes recellularized after implantation. The mechanism will be interesting to study maybe later on. I think this would be convincing to a clinician. It would be convincing to a regulatory authority that this is a good scaffold for regeneration of valves. Yeah, so this marking uh, uh, investigation would probably be a whole project on its own, yes. as, as it sounds. Yes. OK, Maximilian says, brilliant project. Thank you, Maximilian. <laughs> what are the long-term goals for it? Mm. So the question is, what are the long-term goals? Long-term goals. You mentioned a few. So um, the long-term goal is to take this into a um, manufacturing facility, get all the approvals, and actually take it into first in human. So we have had, uh, we have seen reports in the literature of just decellularized valves implanted in humans. Several groups in Europe and the US are doing this. We want to take it into the direction of uh, revitalizing with autologous stem cells, and this is unique. So the next goal will be to actually have a little uh, um, 
manufacturing facility on the campus of Umefetur Gumures, where we would make these valves. We would collect the fat from the patient and implant the seeded valves into patients at Tergumuresh. This is my, uh, my dream. I don't know if I'm going to live to see it, but I'm sure that um, uh, Betty will help me with this and the university. So this is the long-term goal. We want to be able to treat patients with these valves. We are getting closer step by step. Yeah. Okay, more questions. Uh... You talked about a research project that starts next month and the golden question. And uh, lately we have the golden question in pretty much every meetup. Can students get involved in this project? What should we do? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, yes, I think we can do that. Um, you definitely need to talk to Marius about getting involved with the project. The project starts uh, actually started this month. So go ahead and talk to Marius and see if you can uh, get involved and get to the lab. Uh, Ionella Movilan is also involved with the project. She came as a volunteer student many years ago. I can't remember how many years ago, but maybe four or five. And now she's a, a, a main investigator in, in the project. So Ionella can also help you um, actually come and work for this type of project okay we're yep. always happy to marius take... marius being marius harpa is the marius surgeon harpa. that was one in one of the pictures yeah uh marius maybe can you uh post an email address in the chat so that students can contact you if they are interested i have seen marius here somewhere i have Let me see. between 80 plus participants <laughs> hello everyone can you hear me Hi, Marius. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I, I have to congratulate uh, Professor Simonescu for this new presentation. Even I know all the results and the picture. And as you said, Petty, always is uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to, to hear him uh, because every time it's interesting. Um, it okay. was awesome, wasn't it? It, it rounds it up. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it especially. That's great. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, the students, uh, for sure, they understood everything because uh, Professor Simeonescu uh, put there a lot of pictures and details and uh, demonstrations regarding our procedures. And uh, for sure that it was very interesting for him because uh, you know that in... Uh, in Tergumures, this is a, is a great project. And um, we have now a great team uh, involved also in the lab and also in the uh, animal facility. And of course, that now the things are uh, uh, began to, 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 to work very well. And of course, that uh, we are waiting also the students to be involved in this project. Uh, even the projects are smaller or, or bigger. And of course, uh, they can be there for sure, uh, firstly, as volunteers. But uh, uh, as Professor Simonescu said, we, we all started being somehow volunteers. And after that, uh, uh, we remained, some of uh, us uh, being investigators. And also, we are waiting for the students to be involved and to, to uh, become uh, great uh, scientists. Of course, this is the start. Uh, the start. Uh, of course, we, we have now a lot of equipments, and uh, as I said, uh, we are now a team. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we want to to share our work and knowledge with the students. And of course, you can write me an email. Um, if you are interested and of course that I can schedule some activities in the lab and uh, you can be there firstly as uh, visitors and after that if you are cu curious enough uh, for sure that you can be involved also in the uh, all the all the procedures uh, so awesome. uh, my my email I, I uh, write it's it already in the chat <laughs> Okay, great. So it's there. So then, do not hesitate to contact me or Ionela Movigliano also. Uh, and for sure that uh, uh, we can uh, make a, a bigger team. And uh, of course, uh, 
we have some moments when we need a lot of supports from from students also from the university to 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 be able to do our uh, our projects but um, uh, Professor Simonescu is helping us with uh, writing a lot of grants and for sure that uh, we will continue to, to do this uh, job because uh, we are doing for, I don't know, more than eight years. And uh, I think that uh, we can work together uh, uh, at least as we uh, uh, have done it uh, until, until now. Thank you, Marius. Thank so, you. anyone Anything is interested, is... you have two email addresses there and you can write. I want and, to mention uh, that uh, all of this type of work is very expensive and we are making uh, great efforts to submit grant proposals that are based on results from the lab. So if, if you guys want to come in the lab, help generate data that we can use for grant proposals, that will come back eventually in the form of a, of a grant, of a, a you know, funding possibility. So this is a cycle that keeps going on all the time. The more we work, the more data we get, the more we have a chance to get funding, to get more data and so on. And as you saw in the, in the um, last slide or so, um, we, had, we got a lot of papers out of it. We got, um, doctoral thesis out of it, presentations. Uh, people went and presented in different countries, their work, attended conferences. So altogether, it's um, hard work and hard play as well. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yes, and Yonela also wrote in the chat uh, that they have a Facebook page, Term Club. Term comes from Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine. Yes. And you can check out their page and it's a, a student club, basically. You can join and then you get all the information that you need. Okay, any more questions? We are here for you guys. Just write your questions in the chat. So I was expecting 80 questions since we have 80 participants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. They will warm up eventually. It's the first year for Junior Researcher Academy. And unfortunately, we do everything online. We haven't really uh, seen each other like face to face. Yeah. But uh, I'm thinking next year at this time, if we do a present presentation, it will be more lively after. I hope we will actually meet sometime next year <laughs> after yes, this yeah. situation uh, yeah, passes or at least the yeah, I think there is one more question. There is a couple of thank you. You are welcome. And then... In how, how much time, time will you implement it in humans? Oh. Good question. <laughs> um, I, if everything works well and we get support, financial and otherwise, I think it's going to take about five years. So nothing moves like this in research. Okay. No, so no. This Five uh, years is uh, to... There is regulatory stuff that needs to be done, uh, paperwork, but more importantly is you have to have the data in large animals to go to a regulatory uh, commission. If you don't have data in large animals, you can't really show anything. But the moment it works in an animal that has the same anatomy as a human and so on, and you have a good uh, statistical number, uh, that's why we did, you know, so many sheep eventually in the last eight, eight years so that we could show that statistically significant and um, we can convince the regulators that it's safe for the humans and as well as effective treatment for the humans. So I think we have a lot of data. I think we're almost there. We have sufficient data in the lab and sufficient data in the sheep. So five years should be conservative estimate. Yeah, so this is this is research for you guys. When we say we're almost there, it means five more years. <laughs> <laughs> One more but, question. Uh, yeah, two, two more, more questions. questions. 
So I know that creating viable organs for transplants with the decellularization technique is already being researched in the USA, uh, but it would be great if we would try it in Romania too. Are you thinking about trying this too? Yes, absolutely. We do have several projects. Um, I presented one two weeks ago in a different workshop, in a Romanian workshop. We are working on uh, regenerating whole hearts now. So we have decelerized whole porcine hearts and started to put cells back in. So that's another project. And the last slides of my presentation actually hinted to that you guys could get started with this kind of project in Romania, in the regenerative medicine lab anytime because we have the expertise and we know the techniques and you can test anything you do. You can test in the lab and you can test in large animals in the animal facility. So remember that uh, to my knowledge, this is the only animal facility in the East Europe that can do open heart surgery and very sophisticated type of surgery. Pretty much so. Yeah. And it's proven that it works. I mean, it you works. saw all those sheep with their names. <laughs> they were happily grazing post-op. Yeah. More uh, questions. We have. Is there um, any prediction about how these valves might do compared to others that are currently used? Uh, prediction. Um, of course, prediction is easy, but I think the data from the large animals, especially the long-term data, 12 years, would be a good predictive measure because uh, this is an accelerated model. Uh, the sheep live about, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so. So you can consider that the model is accelerated about fourfold. So one year in a sheep is equivalent to about four years in a human, okay? And the, the past histo history has shown that if you implant a tissue valve, like a glutaraldehyde fixed pericardial valve in a juvenile sheep, like we do here, they calcify within 12 months completely. These valves did not calcify. So I think we have a really great advantage as far as uh, longevity uh, comparing to other types of valves. The ideal experiment, which will probably cost a million euros, would be to have valves implanted in sheep the way we make them now and compare them with the same number of uh, tissue valves from the, the commercial lines, like the glutaraldehyde fixed tissue valves. And that will give you the final answer as far as um, if they are better or not. So that's a study that can be done and should be done, but that's a big, big deal. So that was for Agnes. All, all these studies are big deal. <laughs> uh, one okay, more. and one more. What basic knowledge should students have to be able to participate? Is there specific uh, requested qualities? So basically, what is the profile of the student that uh, you are looking for? It's a good question. <laughs> yes, excellent question. Number one, enthusiasm. Number two, enthusiasm. And number three, enthusiasm. That's all we need. Excellent answer. So when, whatever your field is that you're passionate about, uh, maybe you want to go towards cell culture. Maybe you want to become a surgeon and then you participate in surgeries. Maybe you want to work with animals and then you can uh, participate in pre-op and post-op care and all these things. Maybe you're an engineer. I'm hoping there are a few engineers in the audience then you can play with all the gadgets you saw in the pictures. And if you enter the lab, it's an engineer's dream, like gadgets everywhere. <laughs> and you can build them. And now you can 3D print them because we have all these nice 3D printers in the engineering section. Uh, so you will find your path. You will find your way. But you really need enthusiasm, which will in turn lead you to invest your time and your energy and so on and so forth. So I agree. I totally agree. Okay, <laughs> I think that's it. It's been an hour. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for the presentation. It was uh, awesome, as always. <laughs> uh, many thanks for the audience for participating in such large numbers. 
Um, we will end this uh, workshop here, and I hope that uh, I will see some of you in the lab. <laughs> Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.